Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session of the 2020 Postal History Symposium, sponsored by the American Philatelic Society, the American Philatelic Research Library, the Smithsonian National Postal Museum, and this year, the United States Philatelic Classics Society. I am Susan Smith, the Winton and Blunt Research Chair at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. Our presenter for this evening's session will be John Lawrence Bush. He will be presenting Steam Mail, Introduction of First High-Tech Postal Service. So it is my great pleasure to introduce John Lawrence Bush. He is an independent historian born in Parkersburg, West Virginia in 1963. He entered The Ohio State University in June 1981 and graduated in March 84 with a major in international studies and a minor degree in economics, which included studies at New College, the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. John's research focuses upon the interaction between humanity and technology, particularly in the early 19th century. John, please. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It's an honor to be with you this evening and to thank you to all the sponsors of this symposium. Uh, what I'd like to do in the time we have is talk to you about the introduction of what I consider the first high-tech postal service, that being uh, thanks to steam-powered vessels. So let's get started. Uh, first with historians' questions. Um, what is the significance of steam-powered vessels? When did observers realize that steamers could be used to carry the mail? What obstacles did they face? And uh, we're going to touch upon each of these to varying degrees uh, in terms of technological obstacles, geographic, psychologic, and, and legal. And then finally, how and when were these obstacles overcome? And we're going to focus on just two countries, the United States and the United Kingdom. So with those historians' questions asked, let's start by just remembering for a brief moment what the world was like in the 18th century. Uh, the way the human race could move from one place to another was incredibly limited. On land, we could obviously walk. We could ride on a beast of burden, or we could ride in a wagon or cart pulled by a beast of burden, and, and that was it. Those were our only choices on land to get from point A to point B. On water, we could paddle or we could sail, and those were our only choices on water. And let's face it, from our ancestors' perspective, we humans should never expect to be able to escape the bounds of Earth in any meaningful way, because rest assured, our ancestors knew their ancient Greek and Roman history, and they knew, supposedly, what happened to Acarus in ancient Greece when he tried to fly with a combination of wax and feathers. It didn't work out too well for him. Please keep this slide in mind as we go through this presentation and recall that uh, in the 18th century, our ancestors had no reason to believe the human race would ever be able to do anything more than what you see depicted in this slide. Then at the dawn of the 19th century, something really incredible happened. And it's important to note this incredible thing happened while two other revolutions were taking place. One was a political revolution and the other was the Industrial Revolution, as we call it. And that incredible thing was steamboats. In 1807, Robert Fulton created the first commercially successful steamboat in history, thereby breaking through an enormous psychological barrier. It was, in fact, possible for humans to use an artificial power to alter where they were and when they were there to practical effect. No other invention up to that point had been capable of achieving such a thing. As a result, I consider steam-powered vessels to be the first high technology in history. This had mind-altering effects on the first generation of people who saw it, and not surprisingly, there were, was resistance to the implications of this new technology. But in short order, observers started asking a very interesting question, namely, it was quite obvious to them what that question was. And this is a news article from the New York Evening Post, which was one of about 13 different newspapers that were published in New York City at the time. It was one of the more prominent ones. And as you can see, they're reporting on Mr. Fulton's newly invented steamboat, 
and remarking on how amazing it is, it can go against a strong headwind. And if you go down to the very bottom, the last three lines, you'll see they're asking a query. Would it not be well if she, meaning this steamboat, and vessels were known to be feminine, uh, if she could contract with the postmaster general to carry the mail from this, New York City, to Albany. So here we are, we're only six weeks after Robert Fulton has started running his steamboat, and they're already asking this question, why can't this steamboat carry the mail? Well, they weren't the only ones asking this question. Up in Albany, they did what many newspapers did, the Albany Register took the article from the New York Evening Post and simply reprinted it verbatim. This was a very common practice. Uh, in the early 19th century, there was not a lot of original reporting. So newspaper editors would very happily and readily copy news stories from other papers. And in this case, the Albany Register is being quite right in attributing where the original story came from. It came from the New York Evening Post. And as you'll see down near the bottom, they're repeating the query, gee, why can't this steamboat carry the mail? The postmaster general should give them a contract. Well, when did Washington start paying attention to this? And the answer is um, a little while later in the spring of 1809, the National Intelligencer, which was by far the most important newspaper in Washington, D.C., it was founded during the Jefferson administration, and it became known as the Jefferson administration's mouthpiece. If you wanted to know what President Thomas Jefferson was thinking, you needed to read the National Intelligencer. And that carried on through Presidents Madison and Monroe uh, to a very large degree. So here they are in the spring of 1809, and they're reprinting an article from another periodical in which it states very clearly, gee, uh, this could, uh, this steamboat outstrips all the mail service that's available by land. So the argument, you might argue, has been won because Washington, D.C., in the name of the National Intelligencer, is now paying attention to this possibility of transporting the mails by steamboat. So the argument's over, right? Well, no, it's not. Not when someone's livelihood is at stake. Here, just a few months later in late 1809, is the American citizen from New York. And as you can see, here's an ad on the front page, very prominently displayed. And the title of the advertisement is Steamboat Defeated. And the stages are revived. And this is for the mail stage from New York to Albany. And what they're doing is making the point to the public that it's December, and as many of you may know, the world was coming out of a mini ice age in the early 19th century. The Hudson River and many rivers in the United States and, and Europe, they froze over. So the steamboats couldn't run in the winter. And here's the stagecoach operators who transport the mail coming back and saying, there you see the steamboats can't run, but we can, so you should patronize us. Uh, and nevertheless, um, it was clear that the steamboats were snagging some of the mail, even if they didn't actually have a contract to do so. And here is a, another advertisement from about seven months later in the Albany Register. And I don't know who Mr. Briggs is, but I strongly suspect he is a land manager for Robert Livingston, who was Robert Fulton's steamboat partner. Um, Robert Livingston was well known to be a promoter of merino sheep. And in this article, you'll see down in the second paragraph, Mr. Briggs is inviting people to write to him if they would like to purchase some of these uh, merino sheep. Uh, write him at Claremont, which is Robert Livingston's estate on the Hudson River. And he's saying, write to me by the steamboat or by mail. Postpaid will be duly answered. Well, it's pretty clear which he prefers you use. He wants you to use the steamboat as your means of sending a letter to him. Nevertheless, the mail stages continued to fight back. Here we are a little later in September of 1810, and here's another advertisement, again in the Evening Post of New York. And you'll note this is for the Swift Shore 
male stage. And down at the bottom, they add a, a nota bene, a note well, in which they refer to the steamboat as a smoke boat. And they go on to say, in effect, gee, they say they're so fast, but we actually beat them with the stagecoach from New York to Philadelphia. And at the very bottom, they say, we do not do this to injure their establishment, only to make them stick to the truth. And you'll note, stick to the truth is in all capital letters. So the male stages are not surrendering, they're fighting back. Colonel John Stevens, who was actually Robert Livingston's brother-in-law and the nearest steamboat rival to Robert Fulton, nevertheless continued to push for steamboats generally, and in this case, also carrying the mail. Here's a letter he actually wrote to the editor of the National Intelligencer, who we met earlier, Gales and Seton. And this is actually reprinted in a Philadelphia newspaper. So this letter is getting wide circulation in the major cities of the United States. And he states very clearly about two thirds of the way down that the steamboat can perform the journey in as short a time and nearly with the same certainty as is now done by the mail stage. So you have this back and forth battle between the mail stages and the steamboats in these very early years of this new technology. And finally, this leads to Congress feeling compelled to act. So in 1813, they pass this act regulating the post office establishment, as they call it, and it specifically authorizes the postmaster general to enter into contracts to carry the mail in any steamboats. Uh, of course, there's some other conditions, but they're giving the postmaster general the power to do so. And then, yet again, in 1815, they give an additional act, and you'll note the language is a little different here. It's saying the Postmaster General is authorized to have the mail carried in any steamboat in any of the waters of the United States. And you might wonder, well, gee, why did Congress feel compelled to, in effect, pass the same law a second time? Well, actually it's a slightly different law because note the date, February 27th, 1815. The so-called War of 1812 has just ended. And at that point, Napoleon Bonaparte's been defeated and is sitting on his island prison in the Mediterranean. So there's finally peace on the Atlantic Ocean and people are thinking, gee, maybe these steamboats will be able, if they're really careful, to carry the mail along the coast of the United States, in which case they're not gonna be operating within state waters, they'll be operating within the waters that are governed by the federal government. So they've just tweaked the law slightly to allow for that. By 1818, steamboat routes and explorations have nevertheless been limited to certain sections of the country. And in this map you see depicted by the blue routes, those are now regular steamboat routes. And as you can see, they're limited largely to the Northeast and the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. And all of the red dashed routes are places where steamboats have been run almost as a test to see, can we run a steamboat on this river? Is it safe? And in time, those are going to become regular steamboat routes. But you can see there's a very clear split in where steamboats are running and where they could potentially carry the mail. And then the next year in 1819, Congress acts yet again, although this is for a very provincial purpose. And I can't tell you definitively why Congress passed this law. I would need to go look at the records of Congress, um, which I have done many times uh, with great joy. <laughs> Uh, there's lots of wonderful uh, nuggets uh, in the records of Congress. My suspicion is they passed this law because someone was concerned about the fact that the Livingston family, um, not only along with Robert Fulton, had the exclusive right to run steamboats in New York state waters. They also received the exclusive right to run steamboats in the waters of the state of Louisiana. Uh, 
And it could be that someone was concerned, maybe the boat, the postmaster in New Orleans, or perhaps the postmaster in Louisville, that they might not be able to contract with the mail because it would somehow conflict with the Livingston's Louisiana steamboat monopoly. I don't know that, I'm speculating, but I suspect it has something to do with that. This is a very unusual law because it only authorizes the postmaster to contract between two distinct cities, New Orleans and Louisville. But this provincial perspective about where the mail could be transported um, is about to change. And that's because also in 1819, just 12 years after Robert Fulton's triumph on the Hudson River, the very first steam ship is created. And you'll note that the word steamship is in quotes. And that is because every steam powered vessel prior to that was a steam boat. And that is because boat in the English language at that time was defined as a vessel to be used in protected waters. Now, no one would take a steamboat out on the ocean because that would be considered incredibly dangerous and foolhardy. So Captain Moses Rogers, one of the first steamboat captains, decided that he was going to build the first true steam ship, which would be capable of crossing oceans. This vessel was built in New York City. And when Captain Rogers tried to raise a crew in New York, the mariners of that city refused to sign up because they thought this steamship was going to go on a suicide mission. They said it was not a steamship, but rather a steam coffin. So Captain Rogers actually had to go up to his native New London, Connecticut, where his family was very well known uh, for its uh, marine traditions uh, in order to raise a crew. So in May and June of 1819, Captain Rogers then used the steamship Savannah to break the psychological barrier even further, proving that we humans could use an artificial power to alter time and space on a global scale. But the steamship Savannah did something else also. She not only crossed the Atlantic using steam power for the very first time, she also carried some mail with her. Now, we don't know how many letters the Savannah carried. I suspect she carried a mailbag, probably of some number of letters, could have been dozens or scores. We, we don't know and we probably never will know. But what we do have is this one surviving letter, uh, which was mailed to a woman in Brighton, England. And you'll see down in the corner, it says for steamship Savannah. And it says in the body of the letter, to uh, Mrs. Haven, I believe it is. Uh, this letter is coming to you by the American steamship that's going to cross the Atlantic to Liverpool. So there's your first transatlantic letter surviving right there on the screen. In 1823, Congress passes yet another law that indirectly, perhaps inadvertently, extends the federal government's power over commerce. And in this, a uh, very long law, which mostly has to do with discontinuing certain postal routes um, and establishing others. They just note that all of the waters on which steamboats regularly pass from port to port shall be considered and established as postal roads. So a river is now a post road. So the federal government is in effect kind of taking some control over any postal route between two ports, even if it's between two different states. And I put down there in the corner, see Gibbons versus Ogden, 1824. The very next year, the Supreme Court is going to invalidate all state sanctioned monopolies of any kind, in particular steamboat monopolies. So I think this is a kind of an interesting um, relationship here. And it makes me think that the federal government was moving in this direction of taking more control over interstate commerce uh, for some time. Okay, so we've looked at the early American experience steaming the mail. Now it's time to look at what our British cousins did because their story is different and very interesting. 
Initially, the British reaction to steamboats was bah humbug. Britain's leading scientific minds, when they first learned about Robert Fulton's steamboat running on the Hudson River in 1807 and 1808, simply did not think they would last. And the reason they did not think these steamboats were going to last was really quite simple. They knew several things about steam engines, namely that steam engines were incredibly heavy, that they also suffered a tremendous amount of power loss. Now that power loss, you can't really detect when the steam engine is attached to Mother Earth and it's pumping water out of a coal mine, which is how steam engines were often used in the United Kingdom. If you take that heavy steam engine and put it into a wooden hull, people such as James Watt himself believed, you're simply going to shake that wooden hull to pieces and the vessel will sink. So they just didn't think these steam boats were going to last. Well, British perceptions, of course, did change, and they changed in 1812, when a Scottish innovator named Henry Bell built and ran on the Clyde River in Scotland, the first commercially successful steamboat in all of Europe. And in very short order, the British caught steamboat fever too, just as the Americans already had. So then, where did things stand by 1815, once Napoleon was finally defeated and all the Napoleonic Wars were behind Europe and, for that matter, North America as well. Well, this is steamboat production in the first dozen years of this new technology. Um, and I'll just point out, because I think it's interesting, uh, the source of these statistics. The UK numbers are coming from a uh, a very eminent British engineer named Joshua Field, who had a big establishment in London building steam engines. His, num his list of early British steam vessels has actually been back-tested by a couple of British historians, and it has been found to be accurate. Okay, He has a very accurate count of early British steamboats. Little and Holdcamper were a couple of archivists in the US National Archives. And they decided, because they were very interested in steam vessels, they decided to start making a list. And the list was based upon any documentation that survived in the National Archives that listed a steamboat. So it had to be a custom house record that had survived. Naturally, there were some steamboats operating that no records survived for. So those didn't make the little hold camper list. So this is just a list of steamboats that we have actual documentation that they existed. A historian of steamboats on the Ohio River tried to backtest the little hole camper list for just the upper section of the Ohio River. And he concluded that through no fault of their own, just because there's no documentation, the little hole camper list under counts steamboats on the upper Ohio by about 15 to 20%. So if we take that as a rough estimate of what it is overall, you can see that the American number and the American line you see on this chart is actually low. It, it's even higher than what you see, but you get the point. The Americans are building steamboats like crazy and the British are looking across the pond and they want to know how the Americans are doing this better than they are and they want to catch up. So by 1819, British steamers are just beginning to sporadically cross the Irish Sea. And I want to point out in this wonderful painting of the Mersey River and Liverpool in the background, you'll see in the foreground is a steamboat and it has no masts or sails. That's because it's a ferry boat. It's just taking people and carriages across the Mersey River from the county of Cheshire over to the county of Lancashire, where Liverpool is located. But if you look over to the far left, about midway back on the water, you'll see another steam vessel churning to just off the left side, and it has masts and sails. I strongly suspect that is meant to depict one of a couple of steam vessels that were just starting to cross from Liverpool to Dublin in 1819. But then in June of 1819, Captain Rogers and the steamship Savannah 
arrived at Liverpool and they received an absolutely tumultuous welcome. Um, I've sometimes had people at my talks say, gee, this almost sounds like they're a moonshot. And in a way, it kind of is. This was a very big deal. Um, but the British establishment wasn't as pleased with this crossing just because it showed something very clear. It showed that the Americans were way ahead of the British technologically. And keep in mind that just a few years earlier, the United States and the United Kingdom were at war with each other. And it was a very nasty war, as wars within families often are. And the British simply couldn't accept that they would be number two technologically. They had to figure out how to catch up. The problem was they didn't have the knowledge. And by this, I mean the knowledge being the know-how to design and construct steam-powered vessels. In 1819, it was private enterprise in both the US and the UK that had the knowledge and was building these steam-powered vessels. In the United Kingdom, the Royal Navy did not possess this knowledge. So the big question they had to ask is, what on earth are we going to do? Well, at the exact same time, the British Post Office had a different problem. By 1819, British steamers were starting to carry the bulk of the high priority cargo, passengers and mail, even though it was technically illegal to do so, across the Irish Sea. And the result was that the post office sailing vessels were losing a lot of their traffic. So the secretary of the British post office, Francis Freeling, came up with a solution. He proposed that the British government, which was led at the time by the Prime Minister, Lord Liverpool, should fund the construction of post office steamers. There was another reason why promoting post office steamers made sense, and it was actually political. Recall that in the year 1801, January 1st, 1801 to be precise, Ireland was united with the rest of Great Britain, England, Scotland and Wales. And if you go back and read newspapers in the United Kingdom for the first couple of decades of the 19th century and read private letters as well, it will be clear to you that this is an enormous issue in the United Kingdom. How do we bring Ireland into the fold? How do we make them feel like they're a part of this United Kingdom? And with the experimentation with steamboats, first by Henry Bell in 1812, and then by a gentleman named Dodd in 1815 who took a steamboat hopscotching from port to port, from Glasgow all the way to London, showing that yes, you could actually steam on the ocean safely. And then what I call a Western steamer boom, which was a boom of construction for steamers to run on the Irish Sea from 1817 to 1819. You actually have the uniting of the United Kingdom of England, Scotland, Wales with Ireland. So there's a great political need to build postal steamers, not just to deliver the mail, but to bring Ireland into the fold. So such a request by the British Post Office actually provides the Royal Navy, which didn't have the knowledge, with an opportunity. So what's the largest naval force on the planet going to do? Well, it's simple. The Royal Navy offers to supervise the construction of the first two postal steamers that are to be built by commercial shipbuilders. Keep in mind, the Royal Navy has no idea how to build steam-powered vessels, but they're nevertheless offering to supervise the construction of these first two postal steamers. Well, the Lords of the Mail, the two postmasters general, happily agree to this. They think this is wonderful. In fact, they even go so far as to stipulate that the post office will not take construction of these two post office steamers until the Royal Navy has signed off on their construction. So these two steamers are completed for the post office. And in 1821, uh, the newly crowned King George IV is making his first official visit to Ireland. And of course, he wanted to go on his yacht and sail across, but the winds were contrary. So instead, 
he decides to take one of the post office packets, the steam packets. And in this case, he took one called the lightning. And this painting depicts his voyage across the Irish Sea. Um, this was a very, very big deal. Um, King George IV's crossing really validated this for many people who may have been skeptical that steam vessels were safe to travel in across a boisterous body of water like the Irish Sea. And lo and behold, what happens as a result? Well, the post office in the UK seeks and receives still more money to build more mail steamers. And here's a little list of the steamers they built, first with the Lightning and the Meteor, which by the way, the Lightning was re renamed the Royal Sovereign King George IV in honor of his majesty's trip on the vessel. And they continued building more vessels through 1822, three, four. Actually, they go off the page in effect. They continued building postal steamers into the late 1820s. And I'll point out just one here that I've marked with an asterisk, the Vixen, built in 1823. The Royal Navy actually felt like they figured out this technology well enough by then that they asked for permission to build one at a Royal Navy dockyard, and they got permission to do so. So when does this end? Well, from 1821 to 1836, the Royal Post Office built 29 postal steamers. Um, initially, those postal steamers dominated the Irish Sea market. Um, however, private steam packet companies quickly improved their vessels and their service. And by 1830, the post office is coming under very severe criticism in Parliament because many parliamentarians think they're simply spending way too much money on these steamers. And then finally, in 1837, the Royal Post Office um, is forced to transfer the steamers that they had in operation over to the Admiralty, which might seem like a very curious thing to do. But I submit to you that there's a method to the madness, and it's as follows. In the end, the Admiralty learned how to build steam vessels on the post office department's budget. And furthermore, with the transfer of postal steamers to the Admiralty in 1837, they received in effect a bunch of de facto training vessels upon which to train up and coming naval officers. It's a wonderful compare and contrast with how the mail was carried in the US versus the UK. They have different perspectives and they have different objectives. You get very different histories as a result. And I wanna close by just noting that these steam powered vessels are just the first in a long line of high technologies, each of which provided their own challenges when it came to delivering the mail. And with that, I will um, thank you all very much for your kind attention. Um, if you'd like to contact me, there are my contact details at the bottom of this slide, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, John. Very interesting. Uh, there are some questions. What is the significance of being designated a post road? It means that you have, I think, uh, there may be people on this webinar who know the answer far better than I do, but I believe it simply means that it is an official route for the U.S. mail. And I think if you go back to the early, late 18th, early 19th century, I'm sure postal historians have come up with a list of all the postal routes that were officially sanctioned to carry the mail. Uh, the steam technology in the UK at the time about which you're speaking, uh, wasn't it largely in heavy industries, iron manufacturing, for example, um, much more than an advanced shipbuilding? Yes, that's correct. Um, the, the, the British were really the, the innovators who made the steam engine work um, in the 18th century. Um, and their primary purpose uh, for the steam engine revolved around pumping water. It was primarily used for pumping water out of wells and mines. And in the very late 18th century, it was just beginning to be used in industry, say um, by a, a manufactory of some type. And it was that knowledge 
it was that experience with steam engines that led the British to be so skeptical that a steam powered boat would actually work. Rockets were a new technology at one time, I'm reading this, and were even used to send mail. Why do you think that the new technology of rocketry, rocketry did not stick? Probably because people looked at rockets as either something that had only a military application or something that just wasn't very practical. So this is an interesting point because we live in a world where we just expect technology to work. Look, look at what we're doing now. This is amazing what we're doing. We're in disparate points all around North America, maybe the world, and yet we're able to communicate with each other through the internet. But 220 years ago, our ancestors were very skeptical about new technologies. Their lives were pretty tough, um, and they wanted only to consider inventions that they thought were truly practical. And I've lost track of the number of times I've actually read someone who wrote what I just said 200 years ago about how the public's not going to accept in the, say, the year 1810 or 1820, they're not going to accept something until they see its practical value. And keep in mind, in the United States, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the economy was agricultural. It was people living on small farms. They needed practical things to help them get the crop planted, get it harvested, and then get through the winter. So when it comes to rocketry, it looks to them, I think, like a flight of fancy, almost like balloons. You know, people were experimenting with, with hot air balloons. And um, I've read more than a few newspaper editors describing balloon flights as being, you know, flights of folly. So People at that time are looking for something that's really practical, that helps them get through their day and through their life. And the steamboats very quickly showed them, this is really practical. This will allow me to get from New York to Albany in one day, whereas a sailing vessel might take two or three days or even a week. Or if the winds are contrary, I might not get there for a really long time. You had mentioned on one of the slides that steam boats or steamships, I don't remember which one, led to a changing notion of time and space. Can you flesh that out a little bit more? I've heard that argument made for the rocket, for example, the first British train, and it's unbelievable speed of being faster than a horse. Um, but how did that work with the ships on the water? Sure. Um, it's it's very it's very elementary actually. If you if you consider your, consider that you're in New York City, and you want to go to Albany, how are you going to get there? Well, before steamboats, your method was all natural. You were either going to walk, which would be very impractical, or you were going to ride on a horse or ride on a stagecoach pulled by horses. That that was all natural power, or you could climb into some sort of floating vessel. I don't think you're going to row to Albany. That would take too long and be too far too hard. You're going to sail. You're going to try to sail up the Hudson River, but you're not going to be able to accomplish that unless nature allows you to do it. So what makes steamboats different is it's in effect, it's a man-made artificial power that allows you to overcome the forces of nature, wind and tide, to transport yourself from point A to point B. That had never been possible before. There was no other invention prior to steam powered vessels that could do that. And I sometimes get asked by folks, well, gee, why didn't rail, steam powered railroads come first? Um, and my answer is because there's just so much more resistance to pulling a train of cars on parallel iron rails on land as opposed to trying to push a hull through water. So steam powered vessels come first, but they're very quickly followed by steam powered railroads in the UK. By the early 1820s, the British are really starting to push steam powered railroads. 
Um, and locomotives had actually been invented in the UK circa 1812 to 1815, but it's very important to note that the conventional wisdom in the UK at the time was, well, all right, you, you got that steam locomotive to pull a train of coal wagons this very short distance on flat terrain. All right, it might work in that case, but I don't think you could pull a train of cars over a long distance. That's not going to be possible. And I'd really like to see you overcome the force of gravity by pulling them up even a slight incline. So the natural tendency of folks in the early 19th century is to assume that nature is omnipotent. Why? Because that's what their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents had told them. Uh, you had to respect nature. And so the fact that the human race is now coming up with these inventions that allow them to artificially alter where they are and when they are there to practical effect is incredibly revolutionary. I consider it the third revolution that's taking place at this time. We talked at the very beginning of my presentation about the political revolutions taking place, first in the United States, then crossing over to Europe with the uh, French Revolution, and there were many other revolutions that followed on from that. Um, and of course, the Industrial Revolution. Well, it's interesting, steam boats and steam power railroads often get lumped into the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I personally think that's a mistake. I think they need to be separated out simply because they're allowing humans to artificially alter time and space for themselves to practical effect. So you've got three revolutions taking place adversely at the same time. I would think one of the differences as well would be the ownership of the surface. Presumably the rivers themselves were not owned, but the land might be. In other That's words, there'd be more vested interest. Yes, that is a factor. Um, certainly the early railroads, and by the way, this predates um, steam power railroads. There were railroads where a cart of coal or, or iron ore was pulled by a horse. Um, well prior to the 19th century in the UK and other parts of Europe, um, if you wanted to go over someone else's land, you needed to get their permission. And in the UK, that would require actually an act of parliament first. That was expensive. You had to go petition parliament. You had to see that the bill made its way through both houses um, and then was signed by his majesty. Um, and that was very time consuming. And all it might take is just a handful of landowners who might say, no, I don't want your contraption crossing my land. I don't want your rails despoiling my, my natural beauty. No, you can't do that. Obviously that issue doesn't really exist if you're, you're on water. How was the money for mailing a letter distributed to the different people or agencies who handled the mail? For example, how much would have gone to the shipping company and who distributed the funds? That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to. Um, my guess is it will take some serious digging to find that out. One of the challenges of researching anything in the early 19th century and certainly prior to that is the relative scarcity of surviving manuscripts. Now, you can go to the National Archives and see all kinds of government manuscripts. Um, but we're only seeing a fraction of what once existed. And I'll give you a quick example of how that's the case. The US Treasury building burned in the 1830s. Practically all of the records of the US Treasury prior to 1830 went up in smoke. So if you want to research something related to the history of the U.S. Treasury from the beginning of the Republic up through the 1830s, you're going to have a really tough time piecing together what happened. You're going to have to look to other sources to try to piece together what happened in the Treasury Department because their records don't exist. So back to your question, I, don't, I have not seen in my travels to many different archives um, a contract from a postmaster 
to a steamboat or to a steamboat company that would lay out the terms. If I find one, I guarantee you I will take digital photographs of it <laughs> because I'll be very interested to see the terms myself. I'm always very interested to find out what the economic terms are for anything related to steamboats because so much of that manuscript material simply has not survived. So Watt had said, you told us that Watt had said that ship-based steam engines would be less efficient than those on land. Yeah, not exactly. What what Watt was saying, and, and Sir Joseph Banks as well, who was a very eminent scientist in the UK, they just both believed they're not practical because they're so heavy and they're going to have so much power loss that they're just going to vibrate the hulls to pieces. It's not going to be financially feasible to run these steamboats for an extended period of time. And that is because so many people prior had tried to build a steam power boat and they'd always failed. So every time someone failed, the skeptics could say, there you see, I told you so, these steamboats will never work. Why are you wasting your time with this? Um, so it, what, it, you know, it, it, it was a bit of a revelation to our British cousins and to lots of other people, including here in the United States who were skeptical that yes, these steamboats really did work. And I sometimes argue to audiences that you can say Robert Fulton initially broke the psychological barrier in 1807 when he ran his first steamboat. But I would actually argue that because others had done the same, but then they had never been able to come back and repeat their early success, that Robert Fulton really broke the psychological barrier the next year in 1808, when after laying up his steamboat for the winter at Robert Livingston's estate at Claremont on the Hudson River, he almost completely rebuilt the steamboat and then put it back into service in the spring of 1808. So anyone who was a skeptic in the United States through the winter of 1807, 1808, had to acknowledge by the summer of 1808 no th this steamboat is for real these things are these things are coming this is it's it's almost like what we would have said we probably did say in the early 90s when we first started to hear about this thing called the internet and some of us might have thought oh it's a flash in the pan oh it's not as big a deal as they're making it out to be but eventually we had to come to the realization, no, this is a big deal. This is really gonna change the way we live our lives. People had that exact same discussion, 1808, 1809 in the US, and then just a few years later in the UK and Europe. And you mentioned seeing this discussion in the newspapers and in um, letters of business. Was it also appearing in fictional writing? Very interesting question. I'm looking for that kind of thing. I'm looking for anything that I might be able to ascribe to the introduction of steamboats, any way that's changed the way people think about their lives, about their relationship with time and space. I've wondered, and I'm just wondering out loud here, I, I've done a little bit of just reading and research on the Shelleys and their creation of the book Frankenstein. And while it appears to be based upon another book, um, they did ride on steamboats. And I just wonder if somehow it might have affected the way they were perceiving the world and whether that had anything to do with this piece of fiction they they wrote I, I that's pure speculation on my part I'm I'm but I'm looking for that kind of thing I'm not aware of anything off the top of my head um, but I have a lot of stuff on my computer if I went through it I might find something and if I do I'll I'll follow up did the steam shipment of mail drive the development of new commercial centers I don't know the answer to that I suspect it may have helped. It may have augmented it to some degree, um, particularly with regard to the British Empire. But I think the military and commercial objectives 
of various merchants, say, in the East India Company, just as an example, um, they're going to be what's driving it. What what delivering mail by steam is going to do is simply speed up the rate of commerce. It's going to make it so much more faster to engage in business, engage in any kind of relationship. Um, and in my book, I note how British colonials in India oftentimes would pick up their newspaper in, say, Bombay or Calcutta, and the top story would be, well, no vessels have arrived from Britain. That would be the top story in the newspaper. There are no new ships, and that's because they were sailing vessels, and they were so far away. Anytime a vessel, a sailing vessel, did come in to a port in, in India, that was news. And they wanted to know, what did it bring? So they were actually quite keen in India to figure out how to initiate steam, regular steam packet service between the United Kingdom and colonial India. And in fact, that was, in effect, Britain's response to the steamship Savannah's Crossing in 1819. Uh, in 1820. Five, 1826, a British built steamer actually departed the United Kingdom and steamed and sailed, didn't steam the whole way, steamed and sailed, just like the Savannah didn't steam the whole way, um, south around Africa and to India to prove, yes, we could actually travel that very long distance in a steam powered vessel and do so safely. Um, so there's certainly a drive to improve communication, and steam vessels are seen as the way to do that. Do you have any idea when steam mail from Queenston became compelling? Or to speak more broadly to the question of other than a major metropolis like a London, for example, or um, an industrial city like Liverpool, at what point? Is the use of steamboat or steamship considered viable? Is it a size of population, business requests? What would have made the delivery of mail by steam compelling in a location? Uh, I, I think it would just be whether it could do it safely. If it could do it safely and faster than a sailing packet, then people are going to want to send it by the steam vessel. Uh, and that's precisely why the post office wanted, the British post office, wanted to build their own steamers because they only had sailing vessels in 1819. And yet there were privately owned steam vessels that were starting to cross the Irish Sea. And they were granted illegally, but they were still carrying the mail. And as a result, they were also getting passenger traffic. And that meant that the sailing vessels of the British post office were not getting not only the mail, but they weren't getting the revenue from passengers to the same degree they had before. So it, they really had a compelling reason to try to do something. You could argue that what they should have done is what happened in the United States. You simply contract with a private steam vessel to carry the mail from one point to another, whether it's from Liverpool to Dublin, or say it's from Dover to Calais in France. Um, and that was done eventually. Um, so it's it's really a question of when's, when is the passage on what was otherwise considered to be dangerous waters possible by a steam vessel? And once people were willing to risk their lives doing it because they thought this is safe enough, we can do this. Then the mail is just a natural to go along with them, as is any other high, um, high value cargo. Was cost though only determined by speed? I mean, what about the cost of running a, a steamboat or a steamship? Um, the materials to burn, um, 
paying, for example, for those materials and their delivery, the crew size? That's, that's a very good question. And it brings uh, up a very important point. <clears throat> Not every steamboat, early steamboat entrepreneur made money. Some of them realized that this new technology was not only expensive to build, it was also very expensive to maintain and to run. I can remember looking at manuscripts in the New Jersey Historical Society of the Stevens family, John Stevens in particular, who we met very briefly. John Stevens actually hired Captain Moses Rogers to run one of his steamboats. And I was reading the correspondence between Captain Rogers, a young Captain Rogers, and his employer, John Stevens. And it amazed me how many times he was describing, well, the steamboat broke down today. We had to go back to Philadelphia. Or, well, the steamboat was laid up today. We're doing repairs. I've looked at records in the United Kingdom of the early steamers built by the Royal Navy. And they have these massive log books of maintenance that look like they belong in a Harry Potter movie. And you flip through the pages of this and you can see the steam vessels. And it's amazing how often they are listed as being under repair. So do not doubt this technology is a challenge, not just to build, uh, to design and build um, and run, but it's also a challenge just to maintain it. And there were certainly cases where a steamboat was built in a given market, say here in the United States, it receives all kinds of wonderful positive publicity in the newspapers, because of course the newspapers loved steamboats. It brought them what they craved faster than they'd ever received it before, and that was information. So the newspapers were very pro steamboat. So they get all this wonderful publicity and they run their steamboat, and then if you check the newspapers, maybe two years later, you'll see a very short advertisement, steamboat for sale, mm -hmm. you know, advantageous price. So not all entrepreneurs were successful with these steamboats. You had to be very careful about costs and manage them properly or else you'd find yourself putting an ad in the paper to sell it. Well, thank you so, so much, John. This has been wonderful. And we want to thank everybody for their attendance and ask that you join us on behalf of the 2020 Postal History Symposium, the American Philatelic Society, the American Philatelic Research Library, the National Postal Museum, and the United States Philatelic Classics uh, in thanking John Lawrence Bush for this talk. Thank you all. Good night.